Praise God, it was an awesome wedding. The Lord bless us. We're in Romans 2 this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and read the chapter. Let me just go ahead and real quick give you a little bit of context. Many of you are already familiar with the book of Romans. This is undoubtedly my favorite book. And then I have some favorite chapters within the book. But, you know, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, he spoke in certain portions to certain people. And in the first chapter, um, he really reached out to the Gentile world. People that had been worshiping false gods and didn't know the God of Israel. Because you got to understand, if you go backwards, you know, we've been in the church age for 2,000 years and life is a lot different now. Most people have been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But whenever the gospel first came forward, when Jesus first came forward, most of the people that knew the God that sent Jesus were the Jews, the Israelites, right? And so in the first chapter, he talks to the Gentile world. The world, the world that had been worshiping false gods and, and did not really know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and then in chapter 2, he's doing a transition. He's doing a transition. And what he's doing is he's about to, he's about to move on the self-righteous, the judgmental. He's about to move on the Jew who in his mind, see, because you got to understand, if you don't understand something about the first century Jew, you kind of miss the context. Well, what is it about the first century Jew that's so important? He, he was very spiritually arrogant. He was because he believed and, and to some extent he was right, but he allowed his spiritual arrogance to get the best of him. He believed that he was the, the anointed one of God because he was a Jew and God had reached out to this special people on the earth. Amen. And that nobody else knew God except for them. And that not only that, he was very proud of the fact of his manhood and, 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 and that he was even that he wasn't a woman. And so to a Jewish man, he was very, very prideful because he knew the God of glory and he had been given the law and the precepts of God. And so he knew things about God that other people didn't know. And there's a lot of truth to that. Just like you as a believer that have been saved for a period of time and you've learned things about the word of God, right? You know things. There's a good chance that you know that other people don't know. The problem comes in when we become spiritually prideful. The problem comes in when we, be, when we start to think down on others because we know things that they don't know. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've been there. I was a matter of fact, I was sharing... I don't know who I was talking to yesterday, college students way back in the day when it was Ross and Paris and all them guys. I think I was telling Aaron this and there was a guy I just used to call him big country. I think his name was Justin and I think he's come here recently. He wasn't even a Bible college student, but he was hanging around with Ross and all them guys. And man, I'm telling you, this dude was on fire. And big country, we sat down at that Chinese buffet where we were about to eat and he was just like listening. We were all talking about the Lord. He said, we're a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites is what we are. And it was something that the Lord had already been dealing with me about, like telling me, Matt, you know, just because I gave, I gave you a revelation of something, but it's me that gave it to you. And you're supposed to be taking what you're learning and sharing it with others. You can't get all puffed up in your mind. And when he said that, you know, I was like, dude, that is so good. And I just sat there and I listened to him. And sometimes we can, we can become self-righteous spiritually. You understand what I'm getting at? And that's not the right heart to have. How are we going to minister to those that are hurting, amen, and need the Lord if we're self-righteous in our spirit? And so I want you to know that's, that's really the context of chapter 2. But there's some spots that I really want to point out. You'll see as we go. So let's go ahead and start reading, right? Uh, I need I, I have perfect timing to, to get into and to deal with all this technical stuff. But then here you go. I didn't even do it. So let's go ahead and get connected. I got my Wi-Fi on, as many would have. All right, here we go. Let's start reading. There we go. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are, that judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge do the same thing. Okay, now let's just take a second here. I mean, I, I got to read this whole chapter, so I got to kind of hustle up a little bit. But I know the mind of the human. I know the mind of those that even love the Lord. And when you read that, no, I don't. That's what will happen. I'm not committing adultery. I'm not, I'm not committing fornication. 
let us take a window inside the brain. Come on, somebody, help me out here. Let's just be real with one another. Let give, give. I don't want you to see what goes on in my brain, so I'm not asking to look and see what goes on inside your brain. And, and a fleeting moment of a thought is one thing compared to if we're in bondage to a spirit of, well, let's just say lust. Or, or, no, I don't. I don't do the same thing. I don't steal. Well, hold on a second. Let us bring our W. Let's, let us bring last year's taxes and let us see. Go through it. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Let us get maybe Wade's cousin, the accountant, to go ahead and go through and let us see. You, you get what I'm trying to say. You get what I'm or, or the Or somebody that works in the hospital and he pilfers little things here and there. Or whoever it may be or whatever he's doing. Right? Uh, he takes something that doesn't belong to him. Just a little bit, then they'll never see it. No, no, no. A little bit adds up to a lot in the end. You get the point. That I'm, I don't lie. Okay, well, if you say so. But you, you see what I'm trying to say? There's levels to lie. And just because you ain't got caught don't mean you ain't doing it. And many times we can sit there and we can overjudge other people because, hmm, I don't do that. I don't do what they do. And so therefore, in my mind, I'm kind of puffed up. I'm okay. Because I'm, I'm not at the level they are. But look, it's a mindset is what I'm trying to say. It's a mindset. The heart that's been humbled by the Lord that realizes, Lord, woe is me. Separate from you, I am all undone. Right? Jesus, Jesus said that the Father has entrusted right, has entrusted judgment to me. You know, and you know what he said? Be, why? Because I judge righteous judgment. See, me and Aaron were talking about that yesterday. I said, you know, I felt like the Lord always showed me in that scripture where Jesus said, I judge righteous judgment. I immediately see some scales. See, Jesus ain't never sinned. But I see a set of scales. And in the Old Testament, the concept is the Lord hates uneven balances and, un and uneven scales. So if I'm over here judging downward on somebody in a condescending manner, and at the same, see, and at the same time, there's been things in my heart and in my life that Jesus is judging righteous judgment on me because he's kind and he's merciful and he's gentle and he's loving and he's waiting one more and he's long suffering and he's waiting one more moment and he's pleading with Matt and he's pleading with you and he's saying, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they can be made white as Whoa, they can be made white. And so he reasons. He wants to reason with us. But we don't forgot that. We, we don't forgot how the Lord was contending with us last week. And now, look at this poor fool. Huh. Look at this poor fool. He's all bound up. Boy, oh. hey, I'm glad that they ain't like them. Come on. So Paul said, you're in the heart. Treasure up for yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, let's just be clear on this. All that stuff I just said. If you're saved today, you're not going to face the wrath of God, right? He's talking to, he's trying to get people saved still right now. Yeah. I want you to understand that. AP, why ain't saved? But there is a spiritual truth that connects back to believers today that we can still have a hypocritical, self righteous, yeah. judgmental spirit. Okay. Amen. You following with me? All right. Because I don't want you to think, well, because look, the preacher, I, ju I judge wrong, wrong judgment a lot. <laughs> Lord help me. Okay, but I want us to be clear. If we're saved today, the wrath of God has already been placed on Jesus for us. Yeah. Amen. All right. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Amen. God knows how to, how to judge us. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Right. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law are justified. 
You know, that, the beauty of that, just to stop real quick again, was that God gave his law to Israel. His law represents his word. Israel knew more about the God of glory than any other nation on the face of the earth. But part of the, And he gave them the law so that they could understand him and so that they could serve him. But it was never his intent that their keeping of the law was what was going to make them righteous. They were supposed to understand the sacrificial atonement of the innocent animal. God had, had established that in the garden and through the nation of Israel with the Levitical priesthood and with the Levitical sacrifices, they were supposed to understand. See, it's hard for you to see it because you weren't there, but they were there doing it. And what they had to do was when they brought the sin offering, the man had to bring one of the, one of the, the animals from his own flock. If you don't own a part of a flock, it doesn't mean anything to you. But if you had to bring something that you own, that you paid for, that you cared for, right? And you brought that thing over there, and guess what you had to do? You had to lay your hand on that animal, signifying that your guilt was being transferred to that innocent animal. Okay, you don't know about a goat? Well, what if you got a dog that you love? Come on. You got a dog that you love. And you had to, I'm just saying... A dog's an unclean animal in the eyes of the Bible, but I'm just trying to use it as an example. You got an emotional connection to this thing. Yeah. And, and, and you lay your hand to that innocent animal that ain't had nothing to do with your sin. But God provided a way because guess what? Your sin was going to have to be transferred to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us see it. And you transfer your guilt to that innocent animal and then that animal... And and then blood was poured out. Now, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> the first time you did that, oh, it had an effect on you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A couple years later, every time you knew you were sin, right? You get the point. You get the point, right? But, not, and, but, but he gave them their law so that they would also understand what he expected of them. He never expected that, to do, that they were going to be able to do the law to its perfection. And that every time that they messed up in the law, that they were to understand that it was this innocent animal that God provided this sacrifice for their sin. And it was supposed to paint a picture, like this beautiful picture for whenever Jesus came. You see, but they, but they, but they didn't see the, the painting, if you will. But he says this, he said, it's not the hearers. If you want to be justified by the law, it's not the hearer of the law that's going to be justified, it's the doer of the law. And if you and I are honest with one another, ain't nobody but Jesus ever did the law. <laughs> Amen? He's the only one that did the law. Praise God. All right. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. I see, they, sometimes maybe the Lord's dealing with somebody's conscience, and they're getting it right just about as much as a Jew does. Okay, that's what he's trying to say. They don't even know the law, but they, by the grace of God, or by the understanding of Conscience, because God gave them a conscience, they're doing right things too. All right, and in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts. The meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, behold. You are called a Jew, and you rest in the law, and you make your boast of God, and you know his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. I mean, dude, think about this. He's saying, you have been given the law of God. You have been given the known revelation of God. And you're resting in that, and you realize I'm a little bit different than the than the other little girl at work, or I'm a little bit different than so and so because I know God. And he's like, Praise God, you're right, you know God. You got the law, and you're resting in the law, and you're realizing that you got some stuff that other people don't have. And then he's and you're confident. Look, you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. Are you not a, you should be a guide to the blind. I should be a guide to the blind. They may not always want the eyeballs I'm trying to give them. They may not always want the light that I'm trying to shine. But because we know the truth, we should be a guide to the blind. And of them which are in darkness, amen. An instructor of the foolish. He's setting them up, can you see it? A teacher of babes. All this is true though. Which has the form of knowledge and of truth in the law. You therefore which teach another. Teach thou not yourself. Come on. You that preach a man should not steal. 
do you steal? I go back to the taxes because that's the best example I know. Because Lord knows, you know, all right. Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Jesus said if you lust after a woman in your own heart, you've committed adultery. I know. But he didn't really mean it. No, 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 no. He meant it. Because you know what? He rebuked me one time. He's like, you think I didn't mean that? When I said that? And I've still struggled with lust since then. Lord, he's the victorious warrior, though. And the enemy ain't going to quit. He will keep trying to bombard you with lust, my friend. Yeah. He will try to derail you. You are a child of God or else you would not be in this sanctuary this morning. You are a child of God and he is not going to give up on you. I'm talking about the enemy is not going to give up on trying to make you fail. But good news, good news, the Lord, hallelujah, has made a way. Amen. You commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest your God? For the name of, look at this, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Now I want us to just slow down for this a second. It, because you know what? My message is very pinpoint. But there's some, some powerful stuff in this chapter that I didn't even put in my message. So we're just kind of like introductory phase right here. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Now he's talking to the self-righteous Jew. Right? We've already established that. And, but he's saying the name of God is blasting, made to look bad, desecrated among the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles were the people that did not know God. Right? The Gentile nations. There was everybody but Israel. Are you, are you with me? They didn't know God. And, 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 and so part of what Israel's purpose was as when he gave them the law and he gave them the circumcision was that they in world. That's in Deuteronomy chapters 4, 6, and even a little bit in chapter 8. God made it clear to his people, you are, I'm giving you my law, I'm going to put you in that land, and the people around you are going to see you're different than everybody else, and they're going to start asking questions. If you can't make the spiritual leap from the Old Testament, have the word of the Lord written on the inside of your heart, hallelujah, and you are a light to the Gentile nations. Who is the Gentile nations today? Really, until there's everybody that doesn't know Jesus. See, God's moved forward with his plan. He's brought us Jesus. Amen. But the problem that we run into, how do, how do you get this over to today? We get this over today whenever we profess the name of Jesus. Yeah. Huh? But we act in a different fashion. Right. Now, listen, some people in here, we got to be careful because here we go again. We'll, we'll start to say, yeah, but I ain't, I ain't doing what old boy's doing over See, oh boy over there, he's trying to talk about Jesus, but look, 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 look at what he's doing. See, I don't do that. Yeah, but what do you do, Come on, sir? Come on. What do you do, ma'am, that other people are watching you? Now listen, oh, what are you saying, preacher? I can never mess up? Come on, dude. But you and I both know that they're looking for a reason. Are they not? Who's there? Listen, you would be surprised at how much of an effect and a powerful effect your testimony can have on a person's life. But invariably, there's different stages that take place. Some people, man, the anointing of the Lord will flow through you in a little one-on-one -on -one conversation. And they're like, how do I say that prayer? Let's do it right now, preacher. And then some people, you'll be ministering the gospel. And they're like, their spirit is contentious with your spirit. And you're thinking, man, they're not receiving anything. But guess what? Five years down the road, you might hear. They might say, I just want you to know. And you ain't even seen them in five years. I gave my heart to the Lord two years ago. And I saying all right but at the same time how many times do we sit there and talk about the things of god but yet other actions that are coming out of us and they're sitting back there watching and they're thinking and he calls himself a believer he's handling his business in a way and they're offended okay he's trying to show us how to act he's wanting to put the word of god on the inside of us and the spirit of god in us will begin to bring correction to our hearts and minds. Amen. Aren't you glad you don't need me to correct every fine detail? I'm so glad that I don't have to get you to correct every fine detail in my heart because the Lord will do it. But if you do see something that needs correction, I may not like it at first, <laughs> but I will listen to you. Okay? I promise. All right. 
For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision verily profits if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision... That's talking about Gentiles, talking about at the time, you know, those that did not know God. He's talking to the Jew. You're being judgmental. The uncircumcision are the ones that you're judge, judging, right? But if, if, but if the uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law? I mean, again, Paul's not trying to say that, every, that there's anybody that can fulfill the law because Paul knew that couldn't happen. Judge thee who by the letter of circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Now listen, this is the verses that are really, my, my message is, is hanging on these last two verses. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. In other words, God's saying my, a Jew is, a, is the people of God, right? And I've said this many times. When we read the Old Testament, we like to look at Israel, just use that as a name, as the big brother. Because Paul said that they're examples to us. I, this is something that the Lord gave me. He's our father. Israel is his first son. His name is Israel, right? Israel is God's first son. Christian is God's second son. I'm just using this as an example. I know Jesus is the only begotten son of God. I'm trying to make a point. The ones that he's given birth to. God gave birth to Israel. He said, he's my first son. All right. Israel is his first son. Christian is a little brother. We go back and we look at the life story of our older brother Israel and we watch his little journey. And we're like, dude, he made some mess ups. He made some hiccups. Paul said, he should make, that's your example. <laughs> You're supposed to look at that. We're not supposed to go back and do the same thing our older brother Israel did. Come on, Christian. You were supposed to learn from your older brother's mistakes. Amen. So God said, but when it's all said and done, Israel is the people of God. Christian is the people of God. Amen. And so he's saying, when you want to talk about the Jew, if you're going to call yourself the people of God, a Jew is not one which is outward. See, because God's people, this is what I want you to know. He wanted to work on the inside. <laughs> God's wanting to work on the inside of his people. Amen. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now we're going to transition over here. And this is what this is really the title of my message. You see this little, it's a little cartoon picture. I don't want, I want you to get it the wrong way, but it, it's kind of like a goofy looking doctor is what it is. And he's got a door to the heart and he's in there tinkering around. He's changes his stuff in there. And that's the concept. I want you to think that I'm trying to say God looks like this doddering old doctor of course i know that better than that but the idea behind it the concept is that god's wanting to get in there and he's wanting if we would allow him to perform some heart surgery on the inside of us amen and so that's the concept I and mean, listen that we're going to go through some scriptures to talk about that god wants to do a work on the inside let's look at this passage right here we're looking at what we just read in a different version called the nasb for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. What is the big point I want you to see there? Circumcision is a matter of the heart. It's an interior thing, and it's done by the spirit is the spirit of God that wields the surgical scalpel that he's wanting to go in and he's wanting to remove various things. Listen, there's things on the inside of you and there's things on the inside of me that God's wanting to get rid of. We need to move past our concern having to do with addictions that prevent us from even me moving forward in the Lord. Because can I tell you something? God, God wants to deliver us from Pain pills, God wants to deliver us from whatever it is. Drinking alcohol on the slick. God wants to deliver us from internet pornography. God, all those things that bind us up and hold us as slaves to sin. God wants to get rid of that stuff. Why? So he can start tinkering Amen. and wielding the scalpel on the little bitty fine details. Why? Because we 
are out here as a light in the midst of a darkened world. And he's, he wants you and I to properly represent him. He wants to be able to convict us in our heart whenever I respond negatively to someone in a conversation. Lord knows he's still cutting that one out. Amen. But he's over here fighting against those things. He's over there fighting against those physical addictions when he's trying to deal with the intricate details of our personality, right? So I want you to see that. We're talking about heart surgery this morning, and we're talking about that God wants to get on the inside, and, he, and it's the Holy Spirit right there. By the Spirit, not by the letter of the heart, the Spirit of God is the one that's wielding the scalpel. All right, let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Let's look at this one first. This is Romans 8 and 29. And let's, we're going to break it down a little bit. He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What does it mean to foreknow? God has foreknowledge. Amen? Did you know that? And the beautiful thing about the Word of God is that if we will allow it to really get in us, the wisdom of God that we gain from his Word becomes a form of foreknowledge. It's not the same thing as what God has, but it gives us wisdom and it gives us understanding. And we begin to navigate this crazy world with a renewed mind of Christ and we begin to gain understanding of God and we can see this life a little bit more like the Lord does rather than the way Matt does. That's a good thing, but God has straight up foreknowledge. He knows every step along the way and in his foreknowledge, he did predestinate. Now, just because he knew who was going to be saved and changed doesn't mean that he said, any, many, mighty, mo, catch a sinner by the toe. No, that's not what he meant. What was predestinated was the plan of God. Because you see, some people that believe in strict Calvinism believe that there's only so many people that are going to be saved. Yeah, that's true. There are only so many people that are going to be saved. But guess what? That's not your job nor my job to decide. We're supposed to be out there planting seed. God knows who's going to receive. Amen. But he did not say, you're not going to be able to make it in. And you will be able to make it in. No, he said, I'm going to predestinate this whole thing according to my plan that I'll paint from the garden. Whenever I provided skins for them, which was the first sacrifice. Through, I'll continue the painting through the Levitical sacrifices and I will finalize the painting as far as mankind goes whenever I offer my son up on the cross. It's the plan that was predestinated and through the plan of you or I or whoever you are would be willing to accept by faith the truth of the gospel. He puts you in the midst of that plan and he begins to do all kind of good work on the inside. What, he, what does he want to do? He wants to conform you. I want, I want you to see that word. He wants to conform you to the image of his son and that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at this other scripture. Romans 12, 2, the word conformed again. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I want you to know those two English words, conform. One of them says God wants to conform you and make you look like Jesus. The other one says, don't be conformed to the world. All right, this is such good stuff right here. Help me, Lord. <laughs> but the two words in the Greek weren't the same. The one on the left side means to be conformed like God's doing the work. And he's fashioning you to look more like Jesus. The one on the right side, the idea is, is that you're allowing yourself to be conformed. Like, I'm conforming myself according to the ways of the world. What, what, what are you talking about, preacher? You've got to break it down a little bit more. Okay. The world out there has some appealing music. So I'm going to listen to their music. The problem is, is that the world's music, man, they don't like it whenever I preach. Like, I'm telling you right now, anybody that thinks that they like anything that I say when I'm behind the pulpit, like whenever I just show up and I give them a watered down version, they ain't going to like me about two weeks later. I can promise you. Because, and it's not because. Maybe I'm not very likable, but it's because I know what God has told me to say. And sometimes things that are said are uncomfortable. Like, especially if you're anything like I was and you're a Christian that's still listening to secular music like I used to be. And the Lord was dealing with me. And then you come up here and you start talking about people listening to secular music. I don't like it because I think that's a personal conviction. And you know what? No. It's either right or it's wrong. What's the spirit behind it? What are the lyrics that are behind it? I mean, I don't even know what else to say. I know I've used these examples before, you know, 
I think of that Motley Crue song, you know, drink some whiskey, jump into the saddle of you with you. I mean, do you know what that even means? Okay, whatever, let's not break that down. Uh, one country song that I looked up that was after I got saved that I didn't even know about, I was just Googling it. It was called Let Your Heart Be a Compass. That's contrary to the Word of God. <laughs> wait, wait, you know what I'm talking about? Let your heart be a co your compass. In other words, whatever feels right and good to you, you do that. Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked who can know it. You can't let your heart be the compass to tell you where to go because your heart will lie to you, my yeah. friend. Yeah. If your heart is bound up with sin and you're, see, that's what it means to be a servant of the Lord. You're allowing God to speak to you and to lead you and guide you and navigate you through life, not your own desires and your own will. That's not, does that not sound scriptural? Jesus, John the Baptist said, might increase. Jesus, last week, I told you what he said. He said, he who holds on to or tries to gain his life or to cling to his life is going to lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will gain life. That's the con. That's it. See, but, uh, but the word of God says it's not okay for me to do that, right? You know, uh, when I was doing that study, then there was a song that was popular. I Googled it. Uh, I think I'm going to sit right here on this pier and drink myself a beer. I think I'm going to sit right here on this pier and I'm going to drink myself a beer. If you drink a beer every now and then because you want to take the edge off, you don't like what I just said. But guess what? Can I tell you something? What the lyrics to that song said was, I'm going through some stuff. I think I'm just going to sit right down on this pier and I'm going to have myself a beer because whenever I have this beer, it's going to take the edge off and I'm going to feel a little bit better. Yeehaw! Well, can I let you in on a little secret? Now you're putting your hope and your trust, whether you realize it or not, whether you want me to say it or not, you're putting your hope and your trust in the beer that you're drinking right here on this pier. And therefore, you're not putting your hope and your trust in the Lord and a beer might lead to something else over here. I don't know if it does that for you, but if I sat down and drank myself a beer, before you know it, I'm smoking weed. Before you know it, I'm doing something else if they bring it out. And before you know it, I am committing fornication with a woman I ain't supposed to be committing fornication. It's going to happen, my friend. Right. Why? Because it will raise up the old man on the inside of me, and I will cheat. Oh, my God. Amen. Lord, help us. Amen. Help us. Amen? Amen? All right. So don't be conformed to the world. Let God conform you and I into the image of his son. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I want you to know, anytime you, God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The other one, other one says, God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, God's the one doing the work. And what he's doing right here is he's actually changing your will. Amen. Why? So that you can, you can now work. You see, you can't just bu bust up in, in the kingdom of God. Now, I mean, a lot of the mega church concept has a lot to do with that. People hadn't even been changing. They're just plugging them into positions. But that's another story. Because it makes people feel connected. And it makes them want to come back. But let me not get on that. Let's focus on the work. It is God that's working in you because he's wanting to change the will on the inside of you. See, that will is having something to do on the inside of you. So that you can also do the work of his good pleasure. Amen. He wants you and I to work for him. Whatever that looks like. But first got to change and give us the desire to do that. I put uh, this word here is inner J-O. You may not even be able to see it right there. So I think I tried to make it a little bit bigger. But I didn't, let, let me go back and let me show you. Let me show you this word. I'm sorry. I want you to see if you can. You probably can't see it. But I want you to know this word right here is spelled like this. I don't know if you can see all of this. Inner G-O. It's where we get our word energy. Okay, you see that? Now, I want you to see this. Oh, I was supposed to get rid of that. Okay. Oh, here we go. He's just messing it all up. All right. All right, here we go. Now, I blew it up a little bit because I wanted you to see what it means. It means to be effectual. It, you know what that means? It means to produce an effect. Right? It produces an effect. So God working in you produces an effect. The idea, look at this word here, to be operative, to be at work, 
to put forth power. What is this saying? This is saying that the Holy Spirit is doing the work on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit is the power behind the work. The Holy Spirit is the one, again, that's wielding the scalpel and cutting away the little pieces and doing the change and even changing the will of your own heart and life to get rid of your will. Why? Because your will, Jesus said it. He said, Lord, if it be possible, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Praise God. All right. So it, it, it's the will of the Lord. Now, I wanted you to see this, this word, this, this concept. 2 Corinthians 13 and 4, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And look at this. And the communion of the Holy Ghost. Be with you all. I want you. What I want you to see about this word communion right here. This word communion is used a lot in the New Testament. And you probably can't see that. I know you can't. So let me just tell you what it says. It, the word itself means is koinonia. And many times it's translated as communion. Sometimes it's translated as fellowship. Now, but what I want you to see here is I blew it up a little bit because I want you to see something. Right here, what this word koinonia means is that it means Part of it has to do with participation. Participation. See that? Partnership. What are you trying to say? You and I, even though it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work on the inside of us, we have to partner with the Holy Spirit and allow him to work. Do you, do you know before you get a heart surgery, you have to sign a consent? As a matter of fact, anytime you get a procedure done in the medical world, they're supposed to explain to you the risks and whatnot connected to this medical procedure, and you're supposed to sign a consent form. So what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that God has prepared a way where he can open up the door to our heart and by his spirit begin to remove some things, but he's not going to do it without your consent. He's not going to just sit here, lay down on this table, boy, let's strap him down. Go ahead, shoot him with some propofol. Go ahead, give him a little bit of morphine with pain, and let's go ahead and get the saw and rip that chest open. But look, I haven't seen that before. Let me get back in on that. And crank it open. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and pull that heart out. Let's start dying. No, that's not how God works. God says you're going to have to want me Amen. to work on you. Yeah. And you're going to have to allow me. And sometimes we don't want to do that, right? Can I pre can we preach the truth? Yeah. Even the preacher sometimes is like, no, no, I want to hold on. That little thing that feels good. Why does that feel good? Because it makes your flesh feel good. Yeah. But the flesh is the opposite of the spirit. Let me not get ahead of myself. Yeah. Here we go. The flesh and the spirit. I know it's coming up. But look, you may not. This is small, small words. But look, Ezekiel thirty six twenty six. We're still talking about the inside. This is an old covenant passage. What are you talking about? This is Old Testament. But it's telling us that there's a new covenant coming. So this, this was written about 600 BC. So somewhere around 600, maybe 700 years before Jesus was born. And God, through the prophet Ezekiel, told the children of Israel that he was going to make a new covenant. All right? You with me? And this is what he said he was going to do in the new covenant. He said, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So he said, I'm going to, basically he said, I'm going to change your spirit. Then he says in verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. And we're, and we're going to get to a scripture here in a second that's going to explain it a little bit more. And you've probably heard it. But look, I want you to see this. First off, I want you to see this. He said, I'm going to put a new spirit within you. I'm going to change your heart. And then I'm going to put my spirit within you. And so again, here we have this working together, the opportunity for self to work together with the Lord as he's desiring to do work on the inside of us. Our spirit and his spirit are supposed to be working together. Amen. Here's, the, here's another scripture that's basically saying something very similar. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, talking about the new covenant, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant. And look, this is what he says. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. That's why sometimes whenever you didn't even know a scripture, if you're saved this morning, right? 
You, something happens, you do something, you think something, whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, you get that check in your spirit, right? Well, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit. He done wrote his word. He wrote his law on your heart. The Lord's already engraved it. What are you talking about? The same finger that wrote and engraved in the tablets of the law lives on the inside of you now. Amen. Amen. And he will speak to you. Praise God. Our problem is not just your problem. My problem. Many times. Even though we hear him speaking. We don't always hearken. Meaning to hear and surrender. I bow the knee Lord. I bow the knee. Amen. Alright. How did he do that? How, how did he. How did he change. And, and do that work on the inside. Here we go. Jesus said it right here. John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus says, this is before he goes to the cross, I'm going to pray to the Father, and he's going to give you another comforter. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever. Look, even the spirit of truth. Don't you love truth this morning? Lord, help us to love truth. Whom the world cannot receive. Listen to me, child of God. And listen to me, person, if you're in the world and you happened upon this video. This is not to be ugly. I, what I'm about to say, I, I may be construed as mean, but this is not to come across as mean. Yes, we are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. He sent Jesus the truth and the truth, hallelujah, provided life for man. And those that were willing to believe the truth, he gave them the power to be the sons of God. We're not, you must be born again. Somebody in here, I think it was somebody in this church said they were witnessing to somebody and they asked them, but, but have you been born again? I can't remember who it was. I think it was maybe Mike. They were, have you been born again? And they were like, I've been born once. Somebody in here around here said, I've been born once. That's good enough for me. No, it ain't. No, it's not. You know, Brad Bullock used to say, you're either going to be born once and die twice. Or are you going to be born twice and only die once? Yeah. You got to give honor where honor is due. That's just good right there. You're either, going to, you're either going to be born once and die twice, the second death, the great white throne judgment. Or you're going to be born twice, born of your mother, gushing forth in water from her womb, born in the image and likeness of Adam with a sinful nature, but then born again in Christ. Hallelujah. And then you only face one death. Don't fear him who can kill the physical body. Fear him who can kill the body and the soul. Amen. Amen. Now, if you're born twice, my friend, you're good. The spirit lives on the inside. And he says, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit is going to come. And look at this. The world cannot even receive, receive him because they cannot even see him. The world is trying to convince us that everybody is going to be okay. Let me just think about it. Neither do they know him, but you know him, Israel. Disciples that... The church age hasn't been around yet for 2,000 years. You know him. Why? Because he's been dwelling with you, Israel. Pillar of cloud by day. Pillar of fire by night. He's been with you. He's been working in you. But guess what? He will be in you. Hallelujah. How, how did he do that? He went to the cross. And he died for the sins of mankind. So that the Spirit of God can now live on the inside of us. And, and he can tabernacle on the inside of us. Amen. Ephesians 4.22 says this, put off concerning the former conversation. Some translations would say your old lifestyle. That word conversation is outdated in our modern English. That's what it's talking about, your manner of life. Put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You got to start thinking different, Christian. You're not a world. I like this word. I know I made it up. I had to have made it up. You're not a worldling. You're, you're a new creation, creation in Christ. You're a new creature. Put off that old man. Amen. And allow God to renew your way of thinking according to a child of God instead of a worldly. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Guess what? Can I tell you a secret? The new man does not lie. What, are you trying to say Christians never say a lie? Come on, dude. Get with me. 
I'm trying to say the new man does not live in a system of lies. To where his language is lies. That's the language of Satan. Jesus said that. Did he not? He told the Pharisees, he said, you're of your father, the devil, he's a liar, and you do what he does. We're not supposed to be living with perpetual lies coming out of our mouth. Lord, help us. The new man does not continue to do the old stuff. All right, let's just leave it at that. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want you to see something here. Look, Romans 8, 2, and 3. This is such a powerful verse in verse 2. I would, you could preach on this right here. If, if I was one of the kind of preachers, you could preach on this for about an hour. Look at this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I want you to understand that there is a law of sin and death. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. That came into existence when Adam and Eve fell Great. to the way of the serpent. And, and, and listen, it infected the entirety of the human race. All of Adam's children have been born with a sinful nature. Yeah. It's a law. Right? And it's a law. Thank you. It's a law that is placed. But guess what? Whenever there's one law, I mean, there was one preacher, I'm not even going to say his name because I didn't like most of what he said, but he, this is what he said. The law of gravity was superseded by the law of aerodynamics. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has power over the law of sin and death. What does that mean in my life, preacher? It means, what are you struggling with today? You fill in the blank. Whatever you're struggling with today, the power behind that is the law of sin and death. But I got good news. Good news, good news, because the power of the law of the spirit, who? The spirit of God. Is the one that wields the scalpel. The spirit of God in Christ Jesus. See, that's the cross right there. You don't even see the cross. Do you? I probably, if I had time, I would sit here and I would highlight Christ Jesus. And I would turn it red instead of yellow. Because that right there is talking about the cross. You, but I don't see cross there, preacher. Well, you got to understand. It's just because you don't see the word cross doesn't mean it's not talking about it. you got to understand. How did he get the Holy Ghost on the inside of your heart? Hallelujah! He manifests Jesus Christ, the sinless one, for what purpose? To die on the cross to bear your sin, to pay the penalty. And then when he died and he was buried in the tomb and he resurrected to newness of life, and then you heard the gospel and you said yes and you got saved, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. And now the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the Spirit of life through Christ Jesus, the Spirit of life because of Christ Jesus. Now that law. Is, can be operative and you can be operative in your life. What do you mean you can? Joint participation, koinonia, communion, participating with the Holy Ghost, surrendering and saying, yes, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Amen? It's a law. You don't have, you no longer, I no longer have to be a slave to the light. Freedom. Have freedom. And guess, you know what's going to happen when you feel it? And let me tell you what's going to happen. You are going to be so overwhelmed with the joy of the Lord that you know what's going to start coming out your mouth? Jesus! I'm telling you right now. And you're going to quit caring what them people around you think about you because you're going to be like, dude, I, the, the Lord has done that. Do you even think that I care even a little bit about what you think? Yeah, I do because I don't want to turn you off. I want to tell you all about Jesus, the Lord, help me keep it down a little bit so they don't think I'm too crazy. But at the same time, Lord, let it come out the way you created me for it to come out of me. Because it's going to come out of you different than it comes out of me, right? But it's still going to come out of me. Because when the Lord sets you free, I'm telling you right now, you ain't going to care too much about how high a quarterback jumps anymore. You ain't going to care too much. I'm just trying to say about whatever it is you care about. You're going to start caring a whole lot more about Jesus. I hope I'm getting the point across. Yeah. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He had no sinful flesh my friend. He was the unleavened bread that came from heaven. He was the sinless sacrifice that died on the cross. Hallelujah. God condemned it. Praise God. 
Look at that. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. See, there you go. Specific people. You can't be following the lead of your flesh, my friend, and expect that the righteousness of the law is going to be fulfilled in you. We're not talking about rules and regulations. We're talking about the Spirit of God doing things on the inside of your heart and in your life that gives you the power to do things that you could not previously do, to be free from things that you could not be previously free from, to change mindsets in you that you could not change on your own. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but my flesh likes this. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> right? That's the problem. But after the Spirit, for they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit are the things of the Spirit. Look, I could get graphic up in here because I've experienced some of this stuff, right? I've been under bondage to lust. The, do you understand? I didn't even realize how much of dominion to lust I was under until the Lord set me free. Yeah. Can I just be real about that? Because I don't, I hope you. I hope people don't think less of me because I'm trying to tell the truth. No, absolutely. Like, you know what I'm saying? And like, I'm not trying to pretend that I ain't still did, like done some st stupid stuff I shouldn't have done since then. But I'm gonna tell you right now, the, I understand the power. The, the spirit of lust is not my master. The spirit of smoking dope is not my master. The spirit of drinking alcohol is not my master. I am free in Christ yeah. today because of what Jesus did for me. Yeah. Hallelujah. He says, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Even though you have to want to, you're not going to be able to do it. If you're not understanding the gospel and submission to the finished work of Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way. In your heart, in your life. Amen. The flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. I want you to, I need to hustle up. I know. But look at this. The fruit of the spirit. I always love to teach on the fruit of the spirit. Because we're still talking about inside stuff here. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. This, you know what I like about this, the fruit of the spirit? And I keep saying it. I know y'all probably get tired of it. Because it's not a fruit of Matt. Right. It's not a fruit of Aaron. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Amen. He's the one doing it. You can fake it for a little bit. Right? I mean, we all came for a little bit. Look at this. This all oh, I meant to show you. This is what the... Oh, man. Here we go. This was a... All right. Maybe the Lord's just wanting me to... Maybe the Lord's want me to stop. Let's just stop. But what I did want to say is this. Is that in the NASB, the word patience there, in the King James, it's long-suffering. And that word long-suffering is really a little bit different than patience. Long-suffering is patience in relationship. And I could really preach on this for quite some time, but I'm going to make it quick. That many times that if we have maybe Yvette and the singers, y'all could come to the front if you don't mind. We always want to go out of this place worshiping the Lord. Amen? Yeah. God has been long-suffering with us. Has he not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've gotten on somebody's nerves in here at some point in time. But I hope you still love him. Yeah. Because I promise you some of y'all have got on my nerves. And I guarantee you, I can look at every one of y'all in the eyeballs and tell y'all, by the grace of God, I still love you. You hear me? I love you, man. And I'm not just saying that. I mean it. And it ain't me that produced it. Because if it was a whole night, I done wrote y'all, bro. Delete. You hear what I'm saying? The Lord wants to do a work in our hearts. He's been long-suffering with you and I. Let us learn by grace to be long-suffering with one another. Amen. And I can say many more things. Joy, peace, amen, it's all the Holy Spirit's work. He gives us victory over all these things. Let's go to the Lord, amen, and let's worship him. And let us remember to let him do the work on the inside of our hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.